enemy. Welcome back to another episode of the Hardcore Casual with your boy, Base the Kid. As always, please like and subscribe, share with a friend, a colleague, a relative, an associate, an enemy, any and all in between. It's all appreciated. Yeah, there's a few things to talk about. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, first things first, it looks like Adam Smith has now resurfaced um, after a very long hiatus away from Sky Sports Boxing and the uh, Boxer platform. Now, there was a lot of rumours going around as to why he was um, no longer on the scene. I won't go into them due to respect of what the situation seemed to be. Um, there was times back in the day when he was sort of off the scene. People like Johnny Nelson did say, look, he's, he's ill, he's uh, recovering from illness, etc. Those rumours didn't stop because no one came out and openly said like what was going on. But it looks like he had a bout of some form of cancer which he has uh, now beat. So I guess he's put it into remission. He's battled against that. So uh, congratulations to him and um, well wishes to obviously him and his family. Guaranteed that he's fighting fit. Now he's no longer at Sky. Um, but yeah, he's, he's healthy. So he, I guess he either resigned from, from Sky or he was on the, the illness or the sickness uh, reserved for such a long time that, you know, his contract was terminated or they parted ways or however it worked out. That to me, though, it will be interesting to find out where he ends up. But I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't now miraculously end up over at the zone um you know as like a, a head of boxing um or head of boxing uk content or something like that for them you know he kept talking about how him and eddie had a great relationship and they worked well together and he he never really wanted to bad mouth eddie or getting or say anything that would you know uh do a he said she said you know the same way maybe eddie would go towards sky and whatnot and that could be because he potentially was angling for his um, his escape route away from Sky as well. Now look, big platform, big money, but maybe being on the global scene is something that's a little more interesting and appealing to him. Maybe he saw the way that certain things were happening at Boxer and didn't think that um, you know business would be as booming moving forward. And this was his uh, his get out, you know, sort of his get out plan initially obviously then everything's happened and that's had to be delayed but maybe now that he is healthy he might take a little bit more time for himself but yeah i wouldn't be surprised if he does end up at the zone moving forward but that aside uh forgetting all of all of that stuff just happy that he's back happy that he's healthy and you know there's nothing else wrong with him hopefully the other rumors none of those were true in conjunction with with this one but um yeah uh welcome back adam and it's a uh, Good to see you back on your feet. Okay, uh, secondly, shout out to October Red. Uploaded a very good uh, interview with Richard Riappor yesterday, by the time you see this. I've left the, uh, the link for it in the uh, comment section. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in the uh, description, but I'll pull it. I'll post a, a pin to it in the comment section as well for you to be able to have a look at watching your own time. Without going into everything that was said during the um, the interview, there were some things within that interview that did concern me a little bit. I mean, look, some of the reasons slash excuses that were made regarding why the you know the Jayapataya fight didn't take place and then the Arsene Gulamarian fight. They were a bit flaky, a bit wishy-washy. There was parts of it where it's almost like, I think he wanted to say, my broadcaster were not willing to engage, but he, it's almost like certain, certain points he said that without saying that, but he basically said, it's the politics of boxing. The politics of boxing got in the way. Now, with that being said, now that it's actually come out of his mouth directly, we can assess it. Let's pick it apart. So the politics of boxing got in the way of the Jayapataya fight happening. Well, what were the politics? Because 
okay you said that you had you was trying to negotiate this fight with them you've seen that all of a sudden then he signs a co-promotional deal with matchroom ah oh, this is going to be a problem this is going to be a problem you then try and do a few more sort of you know what's i don't want to say that word but you do some some dealings underhandedly trying to cut out one of the promoters um which is which was you know we saw the the, the back and forth like the emails for lack of a better phrase have you know they are leaked if you look for them you can find them um all of which took place after the um you know sort of the matchroom deal was announced and then ultimately it's like well you say the politics of boxing got in the way it was a purse bid at that point politics stop all you have to do is win the purse bid and even if you don't win the purse bid your shot is still guaranteed there's no politics left unless you create the politics now in this situation you've got to say there's absolutely no way you can come out of this looking looking clean looking you know absolved of any blame because even if it's on your side ultimately you have the power and if you don't have the power then there's an issue in the contract that you signed and you're supposed to have good management and good people around you to look at these things and make sure that they're not things that are gonna you know be to the detriment of your career signing a a contract that explicitly forbids you from fighting on another network at the loss of a purse bid is crazy even anthony joshua doesn't have that in his contract if he loses a purse bid he's he can then fight on whatever platform that that who won the purse bid that's that's just the rule that's normally what happens so if you've got something that says different to that in your contract then yeah you essentially screwed yourself out of opportunities but that aside because look that's one thing so then okay we've got other options taking place so then you have the Gulamarion thing which falls through and then he now has to face his mandatory in Unio Dorticos so you've gone from having a guaranteed shot to having nothing on the table now you're talking about you've got a wbo number one spot um you know you you will be installed as a mandatory and called as such supposedly after the masternak fight but i've got an interview with chris billam smith where he openly says that he's contractually obligated to face lawrence okoli after the masternak fight here have a look Fair enough look last two for me um with the obviously eyes uh Lawrence Coley, sorry he had uh, enacted a rematch clause is that still in place or, or is that now sort of out of uh, out of the town yeah yeah i'm signing signed in uh, you know signing this fight after signing to fight uh, Lawrence again so i'll be expecting that after this one yeah see so my question there is how are you now going to fight for that title before Lawrence Coley if he's contractually obligated and he's got it in a clause so one of two things has to happen either you have to hold on to your mandatory or step aside or he's got to get paid off additionally again in order to allow you to take the mandatory shot to then have a shot at the winner but the whole thing is messed up because ultimately you said that you didn't want to be coming to the table like from you know a, pos a position of no power your whole thing with Ben Shalom and all of them was that you unify um, so yeah so basically you come with something to bring to the table so you can have 50-50 so like it makes the fight bigger it makes it uh, better more money for both people but you then are not you know uh, coming from a position of, of weakness you're, you're both at the same level of strength well the only option for you to have been able to do that was to go via a mandatory route for the title that you had the, you had the, the opportunity to face uh, to, to face for which was the IBF the Gulamarian thing even that if you look at it even if you have a um, that would be a voluntary but you at that point would then be at the behest and the mercy of Arsene Gulamarian because obviously he's gonna want an arm and a leg to travel to the UK 
to defend his belt on foreign soil or he's going to want you to go over to France which is what you which is what you admitted in the video that you would have you know initially was supposed to be in France but then he agreed that he would come to the UK clearly that's going to be for more money so you may not have got the A-side money in that one either so you might as well have just taken the guaranteed shot you had which would also mean that you wouldn't have a rematch clause because i'm sure gulamarian he uh, he said in his thing i'm sure he was like he wanted a rematch clause in there in case any shenanigans happened so you would have been on the hook, hook for two fights so the whole situation is now crazy and then so you go from that saying that you want this position of power to now having a mandatory shot but with that mandatory even if like you know you don't have to do the purse bids thing and you you negotiate a deal like Chris Billum Smith is not going to take even money he's not going to take 50 50 with you when he's the champion and he he's the man that beat the man to be the man so he's going to be looking 60 65 maybe 70 percent uh which is I think the the mandatory split anyway so you're still going to be uh, coming from a position of weakness no matter what you do so the whole situation just seems like very very poorly handled poorly managed the, the entire thing is a shambles but the most interesting part of it is going to be what happens when both Lawrence Okoli and Richard Riappo want the title shot who takes precedent who has to step aside and look like an idiot yet again um, and how's the money and how is the money going to be working for that like are they going to just be paid to sit on the sideline are you going to be offered another fight in the meantime and is it going to be at your regular rate is it going to be an increased rate to appease all of this stuff we need to know and now ultimately he's fighting dylan breggy on on an undercard to adam azim like imagine that <laughs> adam azim who's what eight and oh at this point and you're on his undercard big big what is it 19 and old guy 20 and like somewhere in those in those high teens you're somewhere up there about to fight for a world title and you're fighting on next man's undercard that only just started last year like that's crazy ultimately and neither of you are fighting in a neither of you are fighting in like a place that you have a big fan base in adam azim's from slough you're from elephant and castle so southeast west london them areas there just past west london and then you're both fighting in wolverhampton and you really think that signing that that boxer contract live on on the toe to toe podcast was or, or the sky sports uh news channel whichever one it was like was that really the smart thing to do i don't know something tells me that richard ain't really invested in the game like he was a couple years ago i think that happens with uh when certain individuals are around let me just leave it at that for this time being but with that being said it's not looking uh yeah it's not looking particularly healthy at the moment and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens moving forward and last but by no means least on this particular one so we've got what seem to be preliminary numbers that have come out from um america the rest of the world and a rumored UK number for the Tyson Fury Francis Ngannou pay-per-view. So in America, supposedly the numbers is between 60 to 70,000. Um, I think that includes like um, 40,000 buys or uh, maybe 50,000 buys and then like 10,000 uh, streams or digital streams or 11,000, something like that. So I'm not sure the exact number, but if we round it up to say 100,000, right? So supposedly it did about 100,000 or just sub 100,000 in the US. Um, His Excellency Turkey Alice, um, Alice Sheikh said that they've done about 200,000 the rest of the world on the zone. And we heard a rumor uh, from TalkSport how credible that is i'm not sure but it's done roughly about four hundred thousand in the uk four hundred thousand bytes so if we look at it as a totality it's circa seven hundred thousand uh so let's say between six to seven hundred thousand uh to sort of give it a, a broad range now we know obviously the saudis were not particularly looking to make money on this event but I think the idea was to get a lot more eyes on it. So even if 
say for instance they it did a million uh, 1.2 million uh, pay-per-view buyers worldwide that probably still wouldn't have been enough to see them break even for the money that they spent but that would have at least shown that oh we're, we're showing our you know our Riyadh season and our sports infrastructure to a global platform um, and to a, you know, a much bigger global presence to then make more people and more people tune into the next one well 400,000 buyers in the UK ain't gonna do that. 100,000 in the US most definitely isn't gonna do that. And the other 200,000 around the other territories in the in on the zone pretty much shows that there was not a huge interest in this particular bout. Now, I've always I've always been um, a supporter of Francis Ngannou from UFC up till now. Like I've watched the majority of his UFC bouts. I've known what he's about but even in the UFC he wasn't a big draw and I think this now proves that Tyson Fury is not a big draw as much as people will tell you that he's the you know like the number one heavyweight he's the guy in the division like he's the the new money man etc we've never heard any pay-per-view figures for him all we ever hear about all we ever hear about Tyson Fury is that he sells tickets on the door okay cool well now it looks as much it looks very much like it's a guarantee he's not the money man because tickets on the door usually means nothing compared to how many other people can see an event like if it's 60 60 to 90 thousand people can turn up to an event cool but how many people outside of that 90 thousand want to watch you that's where that's where the interest lies right the people that can't get tickets are they are they invested enough to to check out your event and yet again no they're not now maybe that's because they thought this would be a mismatch and they that they were protesting i didn't pay for it i didn't watch it that way so i can put i can attribute maybe say if people thought it'd be a bit better maybe another 25 30 percent might have tuned in but that still would have put tyson fury in the red yet again so let's have a look at it then the very first fight with wilder made money because it was moderately priced i think they were, the guarantees was four million and three million the piece plus pay-per-view so they made money there didn't make money in tom short's fight for the broadcaster they sold like five thousand tickets for that fight in a i think it was like a thirteen thousand seat arena sold less than four thousand tickets in the otto valim fight afterwards so yep more money lost the Deontay Wilder 2 fight was the highest selling of all of them 850,000 pay-per-view buyers which was a very big feat to to have as, as a pay-per-view but they both had guarantees of nearly 30 million dollars a piece so the fight itself actually lost money um, when it came to that it didn't break even because their guarantees were well in excess of what the, the, um, the pay-per-view generated then you had the Tyson Fury 3 and you had the Deontay Wilder 3 fight again. I think the, um, the guarantees were less, but not hugely. It was like a, that went from a 50-50 to like 60-40 or, or something like that. And I think it went from like 60 million guarantee to, I don't know, something like maybe 45-50 you know it dropped a bit but not a huge amount but that pay-per-view did about six hundred thousand. another fight in the red the dillian white fight we haven't got numbers for they, they they all they tell us is it broke it broke wembley records for for attendance but they won't give us pay-per-view numbers the Derek chisora they won't give us pay-per-view numbers but i'm pretty sure that one didn't do very well on pay-per-view either um the numbers i heard for the dillian white one was about four hundred and four hundred thousand um remember that's based on the fact that they had to pay what was it 30 like 36 million um what was it it's like 43 million dollars or something like that or 49 million dollars which ended up being something like 30 38 altogether or, or 43 million dollars down something along those lines right so you had that there so that didn't break even supposedly the Derek Chisora fight held even less of a of a, a gate it held less of a gate and it also held less of a pay-per-view guaranteed that one didn't make as much of the Dillian White fight 
So you've got all of those. Now you've got this Francis Ngannou one, which is, you know, sub 700,000 worldwide with the amount of money that the Saudis pumped into, into the event. Yeah, this is this is people's heavyweight king this is the the guy that they think is a commercial force like losing people money left right and center and if i'm wrong put in the comments leave links leave links in the comments or get someone to to ratify numbers and send to me and i will make a retraction video instantaneously but i don't think you're gonna do that because basic maths will tell you that this guy ain't making nobody no money i remember the last time bob aram did an interview he said that he hasn't recouped any of the money he's put he's he spent out on tyson fury yet that was back in 2021 i remember i remember him saying that so yeah um i'm sure that the undisputed fight would do better a lot better than that one and uh, uh Francis and Garnu rematch, I'm sure, would also do much better than that. But that being said, <laughs> yeah, uh, with the amount of money that I clear that he clearly wants, he's just. I think it's time that people realise that the money he's asking for is just not good for. And I think once we start to get, once sort of Tyson Fury goes, Anthony Joshua goes, Terence Crawford, and like everyone else who's basically been in that position and we actually get to a point where the market gets reset and people realize that their that their value isn't what they thought it was or if it is that they gotta be taking the the hardest of fights in order to generate that i feel like we'll be in a in a much better place at least we'll start getting more of the fights that we want or we're only ever going to get them two or three times a year during Riyadh season in saudi arabia but um until that happens yeah um have a look at the uh, at the false king on top of the throne supposedly but anyway i'm gonna leave it there leave your thoughts down below let me know what you think thank you very much for watching and as always that's a hardcore casual out